And here is the book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. Naomi Klein, everybody. Nice to see you. All right. Uh, so you're back with it. How long did it take you to put this together? Four, four years. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. That's quite a commitment. That's half your marriage. That's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he was around for a lot of it. There you go. Um, so for people who are just tuning in, set up the premise of the shock doctrine. Well, the shock doctrine is about the rise of disaster capitalism. And uh, disaster capitalism is uh, a form of radical free market economics, which is so radical that it can't be imposed under normal circumstances. So. The shock doctrine is the idea that you need to wait for a major shock, mm -hmm. like uh, it could be a war, it could be a terrorist attack like 9-11, it could be a huge natural disaster uh, like the tsunami or, or Hurricane Katrina, and that that shock opens up a kind of a window of opportunity where people are so discombobulated um, in a state of shock mm -hmm. uh, that in that window you can push through policies like radical uh, privatization of the education system or grabbing Iraq's oil um, and or closing down New Orleans housing projects. Well, yeah. To explain specifically in New Orleans this happened with, with, with entire wards. Well, exactly. I mean, in, in New Orleans, you had, that's a classic example of the shock doctrine or disaster capitalism. In New Orleans, you had a desire before the levees broke, uh, you know, stated desire by some of the most powerful people in the city, the, the real estate developers and Republican politicians, who had really been eyeing the land on which these very large housing developments stood, because they were close to the French Quarter, mm -hmm. um, and they were on really, really desirable pieces of land. And immediately after the city flooded, you started to hear, um, uh, for instance, a, re a Republican congressperson, I, I, I quote the, the start the book quoting him, saying, um, we couldn't clean out the housing projects, but God did. Yeah. Or Joseph Canizaro, who is one of the most powerful real estate developers in New Orleans, said, we have a clean sheet. And on that clean sheet, there are a lot of exciting possibilities. What happens to all the people? Well, what happened in New Orleans to all the people is they were, you know, the, the, this state of dis, dislocation was literal. I mean, it wasn't just that they were confused. It was that they were yeah. boarded, you know, onto buses and planes and scattered throughout the country. So, you know, the point of the book is really to challenge this idea that we hear all the time, which is democracy and free markets go hand in hand, right? I mean, this is sort of the, the, the great myth of our of our time and there is nothing more anti-democratic than taking advantage of people in their moment of trauma the, I guess the point of, of a free market is that there is no hand guiding you know the journey everybody can kind of do it they do you make your own way but uh, but obviously we live in a world where that isn't the case so I wonder from your perspective who is who are the people who control this is there a boogeyman is there a boogie woman in this situation where you go they're the ones because you can say the IMF yeah. and the World Bank but who to people watching, who are they? Who is doing this? Well, first of all, I don't really think it is a free market system that I'm describing here. It's, I call it corporatism because it advances through a collaboration between politicians um, and mm -hmm. politically connected companies. So if we look at this sort of free market experiment that emerged in Iraq uh, after the invasion where... The Halliburton you know, experiment. Yeah, I mean, this is nothing resembling a free market. It's, the, it's public money, it's taxpayer money being funneled directly to politically connected companies. In the case of Halliburton, very politically yeah. connected companies. Certainly. A lot of this book... Uh, and you know a lot of this issue centers around Iraq. Like that, that plays a major role. Uh, certainly, public gets the most public example of this right now, isn't it? Yeah, and that you know, the, I, I guess I got the idea for the book when I was in Baghdad reporting for Harper's Magazine, and um, and you know, this was, I guess. That I don't want to sound flip, but it was sort of like an extreme country makeover that was yeah. attempted there after the invasion. Where I'm you had that, that, that has been on TV too, CNN and Fox. They've been broadcasting that reality show for a long time. Extreme, it's, extreme, extreme country, country makeover. Exactly, 24 hours a day. Makeover, though. I don't think they made it over. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 that's the problem with this fantasy of the of the clean slate, because. It is a fantasy. There's no such thing. You know, when you bomb a country, it doesn't go clean. It turns to rubble. Isn't this just this, this the same debate of not rich people, but the wealthy versus the poor? That's it. It's just really wealthy people trying to stay even more wealthy and really poor people not being in a position to do much about it. Well, certainly the past 35 years of, of history has been marked by tremendous, uh, opening up of tremendous inequality, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that in the post-war period, you had the rise of the middle class, right. you know, the post-war, not post-Iraq war, but post-Second World War, um, and a period of real growth, but strong unions and, 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 and the building of public health care systems and, and, and all these measures that, you know, created a more equal society. And I think that the 
disaster capitalism movement that I'm tracking here over the past 35 years from Chile through Russia, China, Iraq, the United States, it's really, it is a kind of a right wing or corporate class war right. of saying, you know what, we're tired of sharing with all these unions and, you know, and spreading the wealth around. We want, we want it all. You face it when you put out no logo, um, to a lesser degree with the, the film The Take, and now with this one, as soon as you put something out like this, you become that person, not the ideologue, but you're the person who, in a sense, becomes a spokes person for this ideal. You're the one that has to go around the country and talk about this. Uh, has your comfort, because you weren't that comfortable with it in the post no logo days, in mm -hmm. fact you try to, it seemed like you tried to run from that. Are you more comfortable with it now? Um, you know, I wrote the book really for myself in the sense that, um, you know, I, I felt disoriented after September 11th. I felt shocked. You know, I felt like we'd lost our footing or I'd lost my footing in terms of, uh, you know, all this discourse of, you know, pre 9-11 thinking, everything you used to know is wrong, we're starting over from scratch, we're all fresh new people, you know, and as a clash of civilizations. And, you know, I, I felt that I had lost the script. And, and, and this process of looking at our recent history, at the 35 years of history, seeing where Iraq fits in, seeing these patterns, making these connections in different countries, is my way of sort of planting my feet and, and being grounded again. And, and yeah, being more comfortable in the public eye, because I feel ready. But my hope is that this book isn't about you know preaching you know, my ideology it's actually about trying to help other people identify how we get taken advantage of in moments of crisis so that we can protect our interests when the next shock hits and understand that just because we're in a, we're, we're afraid doesn't mean that we lose our rights as citizens doesn't mean we check our brains mm -hmm. at the door doesn't mean that we want Rudy Giuliani to be our long lost daddy you know we can be adults in a mm -hmm. crisis right i mean there's basically two ways to go and, and we've all seen this in our friends you know something bad happens you can either regress or you can grow up fast right and this book is about helping people to grow up fast because i think we live in those times you yeah, know yeah. are you uh, there you go um, are you a bob dylan fan um, yes. He has a, a song called My Back Pages, which I was, I, I, he said, I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. And I wondered as you got older, <laughs> as you got older, and as we go through our significant events in our life, do you look back at the stuff that you've been a part of and go, ah, you know, because there's no way you can be fully realized at every day of your life, right? As a human being, yeah. you're always growing. When you look, when you, when you finish a book, do you look back and go, do you ever have those moments where you think, I don't know if I got that right? Or you look back in the stuff in No Logo, six or seven years later, has it changed uh, in, in, in the take? Has it changed? Do you look back and think, Oh, I don't know if I was right about that, about all these things. Do you allow yourself that chance to, to grow away from your work? I, I always, I agree with all criticisms of my work, you know. No, you don't. I do, Not I really do. Them. <laughs> some of them are ridiculous. Some um, of them are well-based, but some are ridiculous. I think there's truth in all of it, you know. And so I'm, I'm not defensive about No Logo. I sort of feel a little kind of, um, I feel a sort of sense of affection for, for the person I was when I wrote it, yeah. um, but I kind of let her off the hook for being who she was, which was kind of a kid. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, which I think is why it resonated with a lot of people because they, they, they kind of related. And I'm sure I'll be embarrassed of this book in a few years. Do you think you will? <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> But that's, I, I but for now, to, but I'm very that, proud. Thanks for coming in. Good to see you. Thanks, George. Naomi Klein, everybody. All right, Scott Johnson, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. We'll be right back.